We're all going to die. <laughs> Historically, we are a lot more comfortable with that. But over generations, we've distanced ourselves from witnessing and discussing the end of our lives. We've mimicked this distancing in our consumer experiences, failing to design an ending in the consumer life cycle. Without an end, problems with consumerism fall at the feet of society. Detached from the consumer, beyond responsibility of the industry, it's this missing end that is stopping us dealing with consumerism's biggest problems. I worked for 20 years in product development and design. Big companies, small companies, hundreds of different products, over sectors and all around the world. And in that time, I witnessed a similar pattern to our approach to building these things. We get really excited about the advertising and marketing. We were going to tell the people about what a great product it was. We'd design, craft, test, and deliver incredible products in usage. And then nothing. We talked about every facet of the product offering, but we never discussed the end. This weighed on me for years. And I wondered why. And a few years ago, I left my business and started to investigate this. Why don't we design endings in the consumer life cycle? Because this problem goes back centuries. I left the business and started this, con this um, research project. But first, I actually want to tell you about why and what an ending is in the consumer life cycle with printer ink cartridges. See, my printer runs out of ink every five minutes. I'm sure yours does at home as well. And you sort of sit there thinking what to do. So you go out, borrow a new printer ink cartridge, come home, I take the old one out, I put the new one in. I'm standing there holding the old printer ink cartridge thinking, what shall I do with that? It's super toxic, so I don't want to put it in the, in the waste. And actually, despite 60 to 80% of these things do go in landfill every year. So I don't want to do that. I look on the back of the packaging. There's actually two marketing messages on there. But I don't need that in this context at the end. So I do what any normal human does and dig around online for about half an hour. And actually found out this company does a really good recycling reclaiming program for 20 odd years. But I don't know about it in this context. I fill in my personal details of where I live and telephone number. And uh, also agree to 2,500 words of terms and conditions, which seems not very in context at that point. And uh, two days later, an envelope arrives that I can dispose of this thing in. I take an hour out of my day, and I go up to the post office, put it into the post office, and then probably two days later, it gets back to them. It's taken five days to end this product experience. It was detached from the rest of the product experience. I had to dig around online to find out what to do about it. Now, you might be thinking this is the result of some sort of hard-nosed business logic, which I used to think that, but it really isn't. It goes back centuries, and it's deep in our society. In 1347, the plague arrived in Europe. It decimated Europe. Within three years, it had killed a third of Europe's population. And in this chaos, new challenger religions emerged, one of which was the Protestants. Now, they had some different ideas of how we should live our lives. Three of those ideas, however, have echoed through the centuries and sort of frame how we live our society in consumerism today. The first one of those was fasting. Martin Luther, the founder of the Protestants, removed an opportunity in the religious calendar to fast. And that removed the opportunity to reflect on the abundance that we have. Another thing that changed was we changed the attitude to jobs. There was three good jobs back then. There was a pope, a priest, and a nun. <laughs> but now, in terms of Martin Luther's thinking, we could do any job, if done well, with thought and care, would be a good job. It's actually the beginning of your career path was then. But the third thing was investment. They changed the attitude to investment so we could start investing in our business. And then we 
Invest in our business, our business grew. Invest more in our business grew. These three things rattled through the centuries. But when they got to the Industrial Revolution, they got energized. You see, up until that point, the consumer experience was very simple. The waste from the kitchen table would go to the animals. The waste from the animals would go onto the land. And the abundance and harvest from the land would go back onto the kitchen table. It was visible, it was understandable, and it was actionable to pre-industrial consumers. The Industrial Revolution took that circle of consumption and changed it into a linear narrative. And then, over centuries, we've split it, beginning from end. This started with an acceleration of consumption. So we were much better at building things in the factories that were coming at the Industrial Revolution. We started to tell much better stories with marketing. Department stores would assemble loads of different products all in the same place. And then later, that was supermarkets. And at the other end of the consumer life cycle, we changed our relationship with waste and removed the opportunity for reflection at the end. A new type of waste emerged, germs, only seen by scientists with scientific equipment beyond the capability of the consumer. Invisible, and it's coming to get you and they're going to kill you. We tell that story again and again. X-rays, the atom bomb, nuclear waste, and most recently, with climate change. It's big, and consumers can't see it. It's only seen with scientific equipment. We also change the relationship at the end by making it far more flippant. Disposability, disposable cups, forks, plates, saucers, everything was disposable. Removing our opportunity to reflect at the end of the consumer life cycle. Businesses, too, were a victim of this biased thinking about endings. A consumer would become a customer in a single, permanent engagement that went on forever. But now that's all changed. We can turn on a customer account like that in a remote server somewhere. But we try and stop people leaving our consumer relationships, stop them any way we can with aggressive retention techniques. Some of the worst we see in cable and satellite companies that only allow you to Leave a business if you endure a one-hour sales interview with a professional salesperson. Or gyms that only allow you to leave if you supply a doctor's note. Some whole industries try to stop us even reflecting on the damage that we're doing as consumers. It used to be common to be able to offset your carbon as part of the purchase of a flight, but that's been removed. Problems with measuring carbon and the validity of those offsetting schemes meant that the consumer lost the opportunity for that. That is a great loss. Removing the opportunity to reflect and the damage that you're doing as a consumer. Now it's easy for me to jump on a flight, go halfway around the world without any mention of carbon. Or the opportunity to reflect, counter it, and acknowledge it. This is pretty damaging for our relationship with endings. I believe that we can change this, change our relationship with endings. See, society tries to put in place legislation to stop us in the worst part of endings. We put symbols on the back of packaging. Some say recyclable, like that should be an option. It should say, recycle, with an exclamation mark, shouldn't it? Some you'll see on the back of your phones, electronics packaging. It's a wheelie bin with a cross through it. It's in your pockets now. With really tiny eyes, you can see that. But what does a wheelie bin with a cross through it say to the consumer? It says, don't throw it in the bin. Can you do don't? Anyone here do don't? <laughs> I can't. It's not actionable, is it? No one can do don't. So what happens when I come to the end of an electronic product's life? I've got a new phone, and I transfer all the stuff from my new old phone to my new phone, and I'm standing there. And I get my old phone, and I hold it for a moment, 
And when I think about data deletion, heavy metals, and don't, and I open up the drawer of my desk, and I put it in there with the other five generations of mobile phones I don't know what to do with at the end of the consumer experience. We've got to stop telling consumers don't at the end. And we've got to start instructing them and designing endings that are informative, reflective, emotionally engaging. I believe in the future, we'll consider bad endings morally irresponsible. But in contrast, I reckon the best of businesses are going to embrace endings as an opportunity, or even a competitive differentiator. When you're at the supermarket buying stuff, do you ever think about how it ends? Or maybe downloading an app, signing up to a service and downloading something. Do you ever think, how's this going to end? Or I'm sure many of you at work and you offer products and sell products. Do you, have you got an ending? Have you ever thought about designing an ending? In the work that I've been doing, I reckon there's four good characteristics that endings have. They need to be consciously connected to the rest of the experience through emotional triggers that are actionable by the consumer in a timely manner. Let me give you some examples of those. So when we think of something being consciously connected, beginning to end, it helps the consumer think, I have an idea that the end is coming. One company is doing really well with that, dominating their sector. They introduced the seven-year warranty about 10 years ago. It's a big Korean car company. And that was into a sector which is dominated by two-year warranties. So when you introduce seven-year warranty into that, it's pretty disruptive. But the interesting thing about seven years is humans find it hard to think beyond five years. That's why you get that cliche job interview question of what you're going to be doing in five years' time, or financial advisors will ask you, what are you going to be doing? And you'll be like, I don't know, working here or something. So when, when you'll be like seven years, it's this void, this death-like void that your product's going to fall into. Since introducing the seven-year warranty, that company's global market share has, has doubled. Their customers consider that aspect of the product offering about every other aspect. It's better than every other aspect of that product. <laughs> And their customers are the, some of the most loyal in that industry. Now, when we think of something being having emotional triggers, it helps the consumer have reflection at the end of the customer life cycle. I'm sure many of you have heard of Marie Kondo. She's a declutterer from Japan. She goes into people's houses and helps them declutter their house. And as part of that process of getting rid of those things, she asks them to hold up that item and say thank you to it. And that helps them reflect on what that's bought them, the materials that's got inside it. They start to become conscious of the end. When we think of something being actionable, it helps the consumer have influence at the end. So many of our products now, consumer electronics especially, are getting thinner and thinner. Pretty much the consumer is designed out at the end. One company is changing this. They're encouraging their customers to open up their phone, change the battery, update the camera, have influence at the end of the customer life cycle, and lengthen the lifespan of that product. And it's companies like this that are changing that bias that we have in the consumer life cycle to make us think about the ending a bit more. Lastly, I want to talk to you about being timely and how that can help bring closure. And to do that, I want to talk to you about a young girl in the UK called Emma. She had cancer, and she needed to go to the US to get some treatment for that. And she's sitting in a ward in the US, and she's watching these kids run up to the end of the ward and bang this massive brass bell at the end of the ward. And you can imagine, she's feeling pretty disorientated by this. So she asked the doctors and nurses, what, what's, the, what's going on here? So they say, oh, it's the end of treatment bell. When the kids have finished their treatment, they can go and ring this massive brass bell. 
Emma thought it was an amazing idea. When she got back to the UK, she told the doctors and nurses at her local hospital. They thought it was a great idea too. They installed an end of treatment bell at the end of Emma's ward, and Emma was the first person to ring that bell. They also set up a charity, and there's end of treatment bells all over the UK in children's wards now. You see, one of the problems with treatment, especially for young people, is that after that treatment, there's no celebration and balloons. You end up in this sort of post-treatment limbo. The end of treatment bell changes that. It's loud. It's emotional. It's conclusive. It's a great ending. Thank you.